CEV Multimedia presents Basic Livestock Nutrition, a video active presentation. Basic Livestock Nutrition is divided into four sections. Following each section, a series of review questions will be presented. Answers are provided in the teacher's key. The goal of Basic Livestock Nutrition is to understand the key topics associated with livestock nutrition. Therefore, the objectives are to gain an understanding of nutrition and what it comprises, to have a fundamental understanding of nutrients, to understand how and why feed is processed. Our host for Basic Livestock Nutrition is Dr. Kevin Pond. Dr. Pond received his Bachelor of Science degree from Cornell University and both his master and doctorate from Texas A&M University. He began his teaching career at Texas A&M and then taught for several years at North Carolina State University. He is now professor and chair for the Department of Animal Science and Food Technology at Texas Tech University. Dr. Pond is co-author of Basic Animal Nutrition and Feeding, a leading collegiate textbook for animal nutrition. One of the first terms we need to define is what is nutrition. And nutrition is going to be the interrelated steps that are involved in assimilating food by the animal for use in tissue repair for growth and for normal function. An animal must assimilate or bring food to the mouth and consume it to provide nutrients for the productive processes. Second thing we need to define is what is a nutrient. And a nutrient is going to be a substance or a chemical compound that is required by the animal for these productive purposes. Nutrients can be considered essential for life, uh, which would be required in the diet. And we have also dietary essential nutrients or indispensable nutrients. Those nutrients are required in the diet because the animal either cannot synthesize enough of the quantity or cannot synthesize them at all. So those nutrients would have to be in the diet. Examples of those would be amino acids. Uh, certain amino acids cannot be synthesized in sufficient quantities by the animal. And so they must be in the diet. We also have vitamins. Uh, and of course, all of our minerals uh, cannot be synthesized. They have to be included in the diet. Those would be determined as dietary essential nutrients. We also need to define what is food and what is feed. Now food for you and I would be the, the nutrients that we consume in breads or vegetables or meats. And feed would be the same thing defined for the animal. In the case of the animal, we'll talk about feeds being usually grains, and byproduct feeds that would be used by the animals. So food would be a term for humans and feed would be a term for animals. A foodstuff or a feedstuff would be similar to the above definition. Foodstuffs would be those associated with human foods and feedstuffs would be those associated with animal feeds. Two other things we needed to find would be that of a diet and a ration. The diet is going to be a mixture of the feedstuffs that would be available for the animal to provide nutrients. The ration would be the total amount of material the animal would be consuming in a day. We can divide animals into two classes. One would be monogastrics, like you and I, that have a simple stomach. It would also include pigs and horses. We also would have ruminants, such as cattle, sheep, goats, and deer, which would be a multi-compartmented stomach that would be consuming different feedstuffs because of their GI tract. We'd now like to discuss the basic classes of nutrients. The first one we'd like to talk about is the most important one, and that one is water. Water is the most important because we can go for the least amount of time without water compared to going without vitamins or minerals or other nutrients. Water is considered to be the most limiting nutrient. Water functions in a variety of ways. It's involved in temperature regulation in terms of sweating. Body heat is also lost to the lungs when breathing because water is expelled when exhaling, taking heat with it. 
It is also involved in carrying all the nutrients throughout the body. The blood system is primarily water. The body itself contains over 50 because there's not bacteria. The body itself contains over 50% water in most cases. What makes an animal thirsty? There are receptors in the mouth, and when we have a dry mouth, we know that we want to drink. The same is true with an animal. We also have receptors in the GI tract and in the stomach, which indicate whether there's moisture there or not. If there's not sufficient water there, we'll have a hormone that's released and allows the animal and requires the animal to drink more. So antidiuretic hormone is involved in controlling the thirst of an animal. Required water intake for animals is a direct relationship to the amount they consume. And in general, we would say that two to five pounds of water will be consumed for every pound of feed consumed by the animal. So horses and cattle would have a large requirement for water because of their large intake, compared to a pig whose intake is much lower. An animal can receive water from a variety of areas. In a range area, we generally would have a tank or a pond where an animal would be consuming water. We have automatic waters that would be associated in feedlots or with horse stalls. Bowl waters would be available, which generally have a float associated with them so that the animal consumes the water, it's immediately replaced. We also have nipple waters that would be utilized primarily for pigs and sometimes for sheep. The animal then goes up to the nipple water, pushes it, and water is uh, ejected from it, and the animal consumes it right then. A nipple water turns out to be more healthy because there's not bacteria associated with the pool of water that would be associated with the other types of waters we talked about. The next class of nutrients I'd like to discuss is that of proteins. Proteins are composed of amino acids. When we talk about simp-stomached animals, really we should be talking about amino acids because it's the amino acids that are required by the animal. In the case of ruminants, they require nitrogen, which is part of protein. Protein can be defined as the amount of nitrogen in a compound times factor 6.25. So if we have 1% nitrogen, that would be 6.25% crude protein. In the amino acids, we have those that are required by the animal in the diet or indispensable amino acids and those which can be synthesized by the animal. Those that can be synthesized, we don't worry about being a part of the diet, but those that are required by the animal must be in the diet for the animal to have maximum growth and livelihood. Carbohydrates are another class of nutrients. They are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Their functions include in the plant to provide structure. In addition, this energy is stored in the form of carbohydrates in the roots, in tubers, and in the grain. In the animal, carbohydrates are the major source of energy. The fibrous components are used to cleanse the digestive tract and rid the digestive tract of toxins. Another class of nutrients is vitamins. Vitamins are divided into two types, fat-soluble vitamins, which are soluble in fat, and water-soluble vitamins, which can dissolve in water. Fat-soluble vitamins would include vitamins A, D, E, and K. Water-soluble vitamins would include all of the B vitamins with the addition of vitamin C. Minerals are another class of nutrients. They are also divided into two groups, macro minerals, which are required in large quantities, and micro minerals, which are required in smaller quantities. Macro minerals would include calcium, phosphorus, and the salts that we would have, and micro minerals would include such things as zinc and selenium that are required in very small amounts. Protein can be provided from a variety of sources, both plant and animal. Protein from plants would include that from soybean meal, cottonseed meal, and any of the meals where we are extracting oil. They're byproducts of that extraction. Soybean meal, for example, is a byproduct of soy oil extraction. 
the meal is going to be very high in both protein and energy and have a very good balance of amino acids for feeding both ruminants and non-ruminants. Cottonseed meal is an excellent byproduct from the cotton industry. The cotton oil is removed and the meal that is remaining is a good source of protein. Animal proteins come from two sources, byproducts of slaughter plants, and in addition, from the fish industry. Byproducts from slaughter plants would include meat meal and meat and bone meal. They are primary ingredients in dog and cat food. Fish meal is harvested fish specifically for animal feeds or byproducts associated with the food industry for humans. Corn is the most common and abundant cereal grain and is the one that all the others are compared to. It has very high digestibility and good nutritive value. It has a crude protein content between 8 and 10 percent crude protein and is a very high energy feed where all other grains are compared to it. It's very palatable. Corn can be fed whole or processed with a hammer mill, which would be grinding. You put through a steam flaker, which would be much like our corn flakes we would eat for breakfast cereal. Any types of processing are going to increase the area, surface area for digestion and improve the energy content. Grain sorghum or milo is produced in many areas where there's not enough water for corn to survive. Grain sorghum must be processed to provide nutrients to the animal. Its seed coat is very hard, and so it has to be either ground through hammer mill, rolled, or steam flaked. The nutrient value of grain sorghum is going to be about 95% of the value of corn. The crude protein content is between 8 and 12% crude protein, depending on variety. Wheat is another very popular cereal grain to feed to animals, but generally is too expensive because of the wheat used for flour for humans. Wheat contains between 13 and 14 percent crude protein, has a fairly good balance of amino acid, and has an energy content that is quite similar to that of corn. It is grown in many areas and utilized as a livestock feed as it's growing, along with as a grain. Barley, another cereal grain, has an outside hull that makes it somewhat less digestible than that of corn or wheat or milo. It is grown throughout the northwestern parts of the United States and is commonly used in feedlot diets for cattle. It also can be a component of horse feeds. Barley has a crude protein content ranging from 12 to 13 percent crude protein. Rye, another cereal grain, has a fairly bitter taste, so animals generally take a while to get used to it. Its protein content is going to be 12 to 13 percent crude protein. There also is a cross between rye and wheat called triticale. Triticale is more palatable than rye and almost as good as wheat. Oats is probably the most popular feed for horses for good reason. Oats has a large outside covering hull that makes it less digestible and requires the animal to chew it for full digestion. Because of the outside hull, oats is a very safe feed for horses. The fiber content reduces the problems associated with colics that can come from many other of the grains. Another economical source of energy